Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk a little bit about drones and unmanned aircraft. In the modern era, unmanned vehicles of any kind are increasing their prevalence in military arsenals and on the battlefield. The kind of vehicle that I, and I think many people, would associate with military drones and unmanned vehicles is something like the Predator drone, a weapon ubiquitous enough that in 2010, former President Obama referenced them in a joke threat to the Jonas Brothers. Now, the fact that this was even used as a joke is a whole different conversation, but what I'm getting at here is that drones and unmanned vehicles are something more associated with the modern era and modern technology. From simple radar and recon aircraft to treaded transport vehicles to small quadcopters dropping grenades. The usage of these unmanned vehicles has really exploded in the past few decades. So with drones and unmanned vehicles being such a seemingly new military phenomenon, it may come as a surprise to some that the use of radio-controlled, remote-controlled, and unmanned aircraft in general is over a century old, dating back to the late 19th century and the utilization of radio waves. The discussion of the discovery of and the early usage of radio waves is its own thing altogether, so for the purpose of our topic for today, we'll jump straight ahead to radio-controlled aircraft. The first successful flight by a fully wireless remote-controlled aircraft would come all the way back on March 21st, 1917 in Britain, with a simple monoplane flying with a remote system developed by A.M. Lowe, a man known as the father of radio guidance systems. The same year, on September 12th in the United States, independently of the British flight, the Hewitt Sperry automatic airplane would fly. This aircraft would effectively be an early crewed version of a missile, then being referred to as an aerial torpedo. Ideally, it would be able to fly up to 90 miles an hour at a range of around 50 miles with a payload up to 1,000 pounds. These very early attempts at radio-controlled aircraft were often fraught with issues. They were incredibly crude, on account of the idea being as new as it was. Control was finicky at best, horrid at worst. The controller had to be near the aircraft so they could see it to control it, and as a whole, they just weren't practical. Still, the fact that they could successfully control these aircraft at range and potentially use them for a variety of roles, from bombers to quote-unquote aerial torpedoes to just simple practice targets, meant that testing on such aircraft would continue well into the future. This then brings us to our subject or subjects for today, an American project to make an aerial torpedo of sorts to make these remote-controlled aircraft that they could pilot from afar and, unlike the earliest versions, actually see through and be able to see what the aircraft sees. This is the Pratt Reed LBE-1 and its two sister projects, the Piper LBP-1 and the Taylor LBT-1. For all intents and purposes, these were kind of the same thing. In December 1940, a year prior to the United States joining World War II, the U.S. Navy was introduced to the idea of using remote-controlled unmanned gliding bombs, and by April 1941, the Bureau of Aeronautics, a division of the Navy that was responsible for aircraft design, procurement, and support, began to seriously investigate the concept. Ideally, how these glider bombs, or GLOMs as they were referred to, would work is that they would be carried on aircraft carriers alongside your standard carrier-based aircraft, like your Corsairs and what have you. One of the more standard aircraft would then tow the glider into the air and towards the target. Then the glider would be released and a co-pilot slash bombardier would control the glider remotely from there. The glider, in addition to having a radio frequency remote control system, 
would also have a television camera embedded in the nose. The feed of this camera would be sent back to the bombardier so he could see what the glider was seeing. Having both remote control and remote vision, the pilot and bombardier would be able to retreat out of the range of whatever their target was, thus keeping them safe while driving the bomb towards the target. In the Navy's search for this glider-bomber design, several prototype aircraft would be tested. Taylorcraft, Piper, Aronka, and Waco would see their XLNT-1, XLNP-1, XLNR-1, and XLRW-1 gliders all being tested for about two years, from 1942 to 1943. Ideally, the most suitable of these would be able to carry up to 4,000 pounds of explosives. The Navy came to the conclusion that Taylorcraft's high-wing XLNT-1 was the most optimal design, but the Navy wanted a glider that could fly at higher speeds, so they enlisted the Naval Aircraft Factory to make their own new and improved design. Now effectively having five different potential glider designs, three different production contracts would be awarded to three different companies for three different designs two of the designs being more unique, and the other one looking like a combination of the other two. The company Pratt Reed would be awarded the first contract in September 1943 for the production of 100 LBE-1 glider bombs. Pratt Reed would use the Naval Aircraft Factory's improved glider design, and apart from a lack of an engine, the LBE-1 looked like a pretty basic low-set mono-wing aircraft. Outfitted with tricycle landing gear to help make towing easier, measuring in at about 9 meters long and about 10 meters wide, the LBE-1 would be able to carry up to 4,000 pounds of explosives. Taylorcraft would also be awarded a contract for the production of 100 LBT-1 glider bombs. Taylorcraft would use a slightly similar but altered version of their original XLNT-1 glider. Measuring in at about 7.5 meters long and 11 meters wide, the LBT-1 would have a reduced payload size of just 2,000 pounds max. And lastly, Piper Aircraft would be awarded a contract for the production of 100 LBP-1 glider bombs. Piper used a design that sort of looked like a combination of the LBE-1 and the XLNT-1, measuring in at about 9 meters long and 10 meters wide, the LBP-1 could also carry up to 4,000 pounds of explosives. Now, looking at all three designs as they were to be remote-controlled unmanned gliding bombs, the fact that they clearly have cockpits may be a bit concerning at first glance. All of them could be manned, but this would only be for testing purposes. They needed to have someone in the cockpit so they could have a better indication of how the gliders controlled and flew. They wouldn't actually have someone in the glider with a full payload. The United States wasn't in such a dire state that they were using specifically designed kamikaze planes yet. But anyway, in 1944, models of all three gliders would be produced and delivered to the Navy for testing, and by September 1944, initial tests of all three would commence. As a baseline for the Navy, each aircraft being towed by a Grumman F-6F Hellcat would need a range of about 400 miles, carrying that 4,000-pound payload. Of course, the LBT-1 would have a reduced payload, so it was already a bit behind in that specific aspect. Setting that aside, though, initial flight testing of each glider would be pretty promising, each of them being solid enough aerodynamically and having a sufficiently damaging payload, even with the LBT-1 having a reduced payload. From a pure flight perspective, they were all pretty solid. The problem, though, was the television guiding camera. Sufficiently powering the camera and the radio control system 
and cleanly transmitting both of them back to the controller was proving to be rather difficult. Considering the state of television technology at the time, this probably shouldn't be all that surprising. Additionally, as well, the glider bombs now had two additional factors working against them. With the Axis powers in both theaters of the war now on the back foot and losing the war, a weapon like the glider bombs wasn't really needed right now. If the situation was reversed and the Allies needed some kind of new big weapon to try and help turn the tide, then perhaps the Gloms would have been a bigger priority. Combine the state of the war with the fact that gliders are inherently limited in how fast or maneuverable they can be, the max speed of these gliders was just 300 miles an hour in an all-out dive, all three glider bombs were now in a pretty rough situation. In fact, in October 1944, the LBT-1 glider bomb would be outright cancelled having produced just 25 of the original 100 aircraft. The LBE-1 and the LBP-1 would be allowed to continue further, but in a reduced capacity. The original 100 order for both of them would be reduced to 85 in November 1944, and then down to just 35 in February 1945. Eventually, in June 1945, the LBP-1 would be cancelled, and finally, on August 14th, 1945, the LBE-1 would be cancelled as well. While I cannot confirm, I do suspect that the fact that the LBE-1 was initially designed by the Naval Aircraft Factory helped lead to its longer career with the Navy possibly being a bit more biased towards the Navy-made design. Despite these three gloms failing, the advancement of technology would help advance the general concept in two different directions. On one hand, we have our aerial drones, as mentioned in the beginning. Advancing technology meant that as soon as the Vietnam War, the United States was using unmanned aerial vehicles in combat, to help obtain data on enemy weapon placements. In 1970, the first UAV with a camera for recon purposes would be seen in Israel. As mentioned earlier, these aircraft would advance and evolve significantly to be a key aspect of modern warfare. On the other hand, we have the creation and expansion of guided missiles. While in World War II, we would see the use of some more primitive guided bombs, like the radar-guided BAT, we would see advancements on television-guided weapons along with advancements into infrared, laser, and satellite guidance. Today, because of evolving technology, we have missiles and drones that could be fired halfway across the world at targets halfway across the world. With where technology is now, it makes glider bombs like the gloms seem almost quaint and comical. As one final note on the gloms, let's assume for a second that they were adopted for use on aircraft carriers and the like. How useful would they have really been? Would they really have been worth it? Personally, I don't really think so. The fact that they were the size of small aircraft meant that they really just took up too much space valuable space that could be used for another fully functional aircraft. I mean, compare two fighters to one fighter and one glider bomb. What pair would be more valuable? The glider bombs would have just been a waste of valuable space and resources. Regardless of how pointless I think they may have been, the fact still remains that they were an interesting step, or perhaps detour, on the way to unmanned vehicles and guided weaponry, and for that I think they're pretty interesting, and I think their name was interesting too. Gloms. Alright, and with that I think we'll go ahead and end there for today. Thank you all for watching, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I really do love the fact that they're called gloms. It's oddly adorable and makes them sound like a weird children's toy from the 90s. Like water balloons filled with slime or Elmer's glue. 
the kind of toy your parents wouldn't allow you to get because it would get in the carpet too much. Anyway, though, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.